Hey everybody, this is Alexandra Metters of GalacticConnection.com and today is May 12th, 2015. Now, before we dive into who I'll be interviewing today, I just have a couple of announcements to make. I want everyone to know that I've been a little bit quiet on my blog because I have some pretty important information to share soon. And what I would like to put out there right now, today, is you, you, all of you that are waiting for some sort of call or event or what have you, you are it. You are right there. You are it. I want you to open up your ears and your eyes and really pay attention to the messages that are coming forth. And that's all I'm going to say for right now. But anyway, uh... As everyone is well aware of Kevin Annette, we have a very interesting show today. This is a little bit different than any others that we've done before. And before I get into that, I will go ahead and give you some background on him for those that are not familiar with Kevin. If you've been following GalacticConnection.com, there are quite a few interviews that he and I have done together, so please make yourself readily aware of those. You can find all of my interviews at the top tab of the menu under Alexander's interviews. There's also transcripts to every interview, just about. So uh, with that said, Kevin has been a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2013 and 2014, and he is a community minister, human rights consultant. He's also the field secretary for the International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State and the award-winning documentary filmmaker of Unrepentant. He's also an author, has just released a book and all kinds of good things. His resume is phenomenal. Um, he was ordained as a clergyman in the United Church of Canada, and this is where it all got started with Kevin. He really got hot under the collar when he was fired without cause and expelled from the ministry, and it really was divine because he ended up diving into some very dark, dark corners and finding out what's truly going on behind closed doors within the church and within the state that's referred to related to the church so a lot of times people don't really want to hear this kind of stuff they really want to put it on the back burner but I feel that today is very important for many reasons you're going to see why um, and Kevin is going to also update us on any other new I don't know under anything that's coming on out with uh, Kevin's latest work. So with that said, hello, Kevin. Hi, Alexandra. How are you today? Well, I'm fine. Well, it's good. Really good, actually. Yeah, I, I, know you, I know you said I look tired, uh, <laughs> but I'm actually not feeling tired inside. I'm feeling very charged up and focused, so. Good. And yeah. I think a lot of people are happy to hear that because we don't hear from you as much, and I know it's because you're working really, really hard, like many of us are. So uh, today what we're going to do, now this is really different than most of the time. Um, Kevin was involved in an investigation back in 2011 in Brantford, Ontario. I'm going to look at my notes here. And he uncovered some forensic evidence of children that had been buried uh, in one of the oldest Indian residential schools in Canada. So uh, this is a really interesting investigation. I had not been aware of all that had been done this really puts some validity into the work that he's done. I think people really want to see this sort of thing. They certainly don't want to hear about the topic, but this is going to really, per, I don't know, it's going to trickle into a lot of different other areas of society, huh, Kevin? And um, it's really important for all of us to see what's been done, who's involved, why did it happen, just a lot more details. You know me, I'm a detail-oriented freak. So um, I, I kind of want to start it out with, Kevin, is um, where is Brantford, Ontario, for those that are not from Canada? Well, if you go to uh, New York State and then you head towards Niagara Falls, you go up into Canada and Ontario, and it's kind of a bit in from the border on the way up to Toronto. Uh, so the southern Ontario, you know, between Niagara Falls and Detroit, that area. Um, okay named Brantford after Joseph Brant, who was a Mohawk war chief. He fought on the side of the British against the Americans, so he's held up as a big hero in Canada because he kept you Yankees out of Canada, right? But uh, actually what he was, uh, Joseph Brant was the first Mohawk chief to sign away his own children into the residential schools because these were 
These were set up as far back as the 1830s, um, and they were internment camps. The Mohawks would not play ball with the British Crown. They did not sign over a lot of the land that the British wanted. Mm. And um, as a result, they were targeted for extermination. And this is something we found out in the course of working at what's called the Mosh Hole, which is what the survivors of the school called it, the Mohawk Industrial School. Uh, was around till the 1970s. It was 140 years this thing existed. That's how long I was going to ask you that. Like, how long yeah. did this church, you know, survive? I mean, this you know, it, it, it was the Crown of England and the Church of England for almost a century and a half. It was the oldest, longest one in Canada. And the reason it was, it was the first, it was, the, it was like the template for the whole system. And we found out that the Jesuits and the Crown of England were active very much in, in using this place to perfect their techniques of torture and mind control from a very early, very early on. Yeah. Uh, we found that from documents. And I'm going to get into a lot of that detail, but just kind of the overview, first of all, is that we hit the mother load when we began digging at that school. We immediately found evidence of everything the survivors have been saying about children being buried there and everything. And, and now, why did they call it the mush hole? Because uh, that's what they were given to eat when they were given food. It was mush. It was maggot filled porridge uh, that they had to eat. A lot of the times uh, there was a guy, Geronimo Henry, who was a survivor uh, who I spoke to when we were doing the dig in 2011. He was one of our guides. He pointed out where he had buried children at night. This is during the 1950s and early 60s when he was a student there. Um, and they said, yeah, they, often I didn't eat at all. They didn't feed us. We had to go and rummage the garbage in the back to find any food. Half the children died in there, usually of starvation or disease. Right up to the 1970s, okay, we're talking. So um, this was the norm across Canada, but this was especially bad place because uh, there were all sorts of rituals going on there that, that we'll get into. Well, but, um, do me yeah. a favor, you, you know, be, before I even ask you this, I just want to tell the audience Kevin approached me and said, hey, would you be willing to do an expose on this investigation? I said, absolutely, if it's to reveal all the secrets regarding child abuse and, and trafficking and that kind of thing, why not? As I delved into this information, I mean, I sobbed. I literally wept. I mean, there are, just to show everybody, how many testimonials? Oh, yeah, and lots. I read through these, I was just literally crying my eyes out. And the one realization I had, I know people might get a little bit maybe tired hearing about this, but what I realized was this is a prototype and I was thinking to myself, how many other countries, states, provinces around the world that this was happening? You know, that, that was the first thing that happened. I, I had such an aha moment about how they have been programming the children. And I noticed that they have like the protected children and the unprotected children. I was going to ask you a little bit about that too. But um, I don't know, Kevin, that was like the first thing that hit me. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, of course, it wasn't just aboriginals they targeted. They, they, they were just easy to get because under the law, they're not citizens. They can be taken at any point and there's no legal repercussions when you do that. Um, but the, the, the point is, is that it was a system in place to kill off half of them and then traumatize the survivors so that they would never create a fuss when their land was being sold off, the resources were being sold away. Um, there's a, I don't know if you can see that very well. That's a bone. Yes. That's a, that's a knee socket bone of a five-year-old child. I don't know. That might be better. That's a, how we found it in the ground. It was identified as positively human wow. by a two, uh, the provincial coroner for Ontario, a guy called Greg Olson. Yeah. He sat there and looked at the bone, and he, we have all this on tape, and he said, I'm 95% sure this is a child's knee socket. I'll stake my reputation on it. And what was also interesting is uh, Geronimo said whenever they buried the children, they would plant a tree on top of the grave. Now, I and, why is that, Kevin? I was going to ask. Well, to hide, to hide the remains so that the tree would grow over it and would be hard. It's harder to dig up the roots of a tree. It was standard procedure. When we turned over this tree, within half an hour of us beginning to excavate, we found small buttons and bones entangled in the roots of a tree. Oh, my God. Okay, and these buttons were identified as coming from the school uniforms. They weren't plastic, so it would be before the 50s. 
1950s. These were oh. we wooden and bone buttons, and they were identified. So, I mean, that's pretty conclusive right there. Well, I kind of wanted to, you know, you have so much information here. Let, let's try to give the listeners a little bit of, yeah. a, of a timeline. So, going all the way back, it, supposedly the Mohawk Institute was founded in 1832 by the Crown and the Church of England. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, why? You know, what was the purpose right. of the schools? What was, and, and has there been any kind of paperwork found as to the development of the school system for Aboriginal children? The paperwork and documents have been systematically destroyed and hidden by the churches. We're talking Anglican Church in this case, uh, Church of England, United Church of Canada, that was the one I was in that they threw me out of uh, when I found out this stuff, and the Roman Catholics, of course, that ran about two thirds of these places. Um, and don't forget, it was a Jesuit model that established these places. They were wow. going back, um, there was a, a Jesuit plan in place as far back as the 1700s of how you exterminate a local community and um, you, you basically wipe out the traditional leadership and then you, you put in um, chiefs that have been converted to Catholicism and you set up uh, what they called a watchman system where the Catholic Indians would watch their own people and if any of them spoke their own language or did their traditional ways and teachings, they were eliminated. So it was a spy system within the Indian community, divide and conquer. And they just took that system and transferred it in, in, in the Indian residential schools, both in Canada and America. So um, yes, the uh, Jesuit, the one case in America, the lawsuit that happened three years ago uh, against the Jesuit schools in South Dakota and Washington, uh, it was found that uh, there were just the same kind of crimes going on there, killings. We talked to a woman who saw a little baby, newborn baby, buried beneath the boards, the floorboards of a, of a Jesuit school in, in Omak, Washington in 1971, this happened. Um, I mean, so all the same kind of crimes going on in America. But the, the plan was basically to use these, these internment camps to eradicate targeted cultures. And the best way to do that is not just through simple killing, but reprogramming the next generation. Right, which I is, that. <laughs> which has really succeeded. I mean, that's exactly why people are called Aboriginal, not of the original group. You know. Oh, thank you for that. And, and in fact, uh, one of the other things that just kept hitting me over and over as I was reading this documentation was this was literally a World War II environment, uh, except maybe not called a concentration camp. But I have read up quite a bit from uh, when I visited Dachau when I was 21 mm -hmm. and uh, read a lot of stuff. I was very, very in my youth, I was very involved in reading about uh, concentration camps because I believe that was one of my past lives. And uh, I found just horrific experiments that had been done on all different ages and all different purposes. And to, to think that this was going on underneath people's noses right in middle America, let, ago, let alone in Canada, was just, it was shocking to me that it was going on all the way through the 70s. Well, that's important what, what you're saying, because the thing to understand, the British Empire invented the term concentration camp um, huh. during the Boer War, when they were fighting the Boers in South Africa. Uh, they, they interned a lot of the civilians, women and children in these concentration camps where 20,000 of them died, and to try to break the morale of the Boer soldiers. Um, they then, the Germans actually picked up that model um, and in Mein Kampf, Hitler says, we intend to do to the, the Untermenschen, the under the subhumans of Europe, what the Americans have done to their Indians. We intend to model it on their system, uh, not just outright extermination, which is only the first stage, but it's the concentration in artificial environments, internment camps, special laws called the Indian Act, reservations, which are really concentration camps. Um, that whole model was used by the by the Nazis, and of course it went back and forth because after the war, under Project Paperclip, something like thirteen thousand Nazi scientists were brought over to work on the space program and these programs in the Indian schools. So we actually, after World War II, we saw a peak of a lot of these atrocities and experimental programs going on in the Indian schools with SS doctors. Uh, I spoke to a woman in Alberta who described the torture being done on her 
and the guy had an SS tattoo right here, wow. uh, the guy who was doing it. Uh, there are a lot of stuff. Uh, it's all being well documented. There's a good book called Jim, um, The Fourth Reich by Jim Mars about how the Nazi regime kind of transported itself into America after World War II and helped establish the whole Cold War philosophy of the State Department and the CIA. I mean, every top official of NASA were Nazis. Uh, Kurt DeBoos, uh, who did the Apollo space program, uh, you know, uh, Hubert uh, Strughold, who did the, uh, who allowed the Apollo astronauts to uh, have their, you know, uh, do their programs. They were all SS doctors, uh, Werner von Braun. I mean, it, it's filled with, the system is filled with these guys. Unbelievable. So now tell us a little bit about the schools themselves. You said that they're, they're follow, following a Jesuit model. So how exactly were they run? How many you know, total students were they allowed to have? And how did they actually bring the students into the school? Well, first of all, uh, I want to tell everyone that you can read all of this and see all of the evidence online. Uh, our tribunal website, itccs.org, if you look on the masthead, it'll see uh, case number one, genocide in Canada, and there's almost four hours of documented evidence on there. You know, eyewitness testimonies, everything. So you can watch this for yourself at itccs.org. But uh, in a nutshell, the, the system was mandated by law in Canada in 1920, a federal law brought in not by the parliament, but by order and council. So the, a few of the Queen's representatives kind of drafted this law and ran it through. It said every, every native child seven years and older had to be incarcerated in these places or their parents would go to jail. Uh, they could hold them legally till they're 18, but they could extend that if they wanted at any point. They had no rights. Um, they had to basically conform to this military regime where they got minimal amount of education, a certain functional intelligence they were taught. And they were really a slave labor class. They were used, uh, the, the young girls were used as domestics uh, the young boys in field work, uh, construction work. I mean, there was a slave labor population um, under the appearance of, of education. Uh, half the kids died because in the early phases in the schools, the plan was biological warfare. And and I found this out on the west coast of Canada, you know, from a lot of documents and people coming to me back in the mid nineties when I started this work. The most common practice was you'd take children who were sick with tuberculosis and smallpox, lock them in the same dormitory as the healthy, never treat them. It would spread quickly. The own government's own documents show that as far back as 1909, the death rate was over 50%. And it stayed that way for over half a century. So that doesn't happen if it's random. That happens because of an organized plan of depopulation yeah. using these. Yeah. And that's exactly what went on. 50,000 more children never came back. So you actually said that this uh, school was run for over 140 years, yeah. from 1832 to 1970. 70. 1970. Yes. And and how did it end up being closed? I'm curious. Well, there was a, actually the incident uh, we found out that caused it to be closed is there was a young boy called Joey Commanda. He was 13. He tried running away from the school because he'd been horribly tortured. They had electric, uh, ch an electric chair in the basement where they would shock kids. They were using a rack to stretch them. They were giving them, I mean, it was horrible. Some of the things we, we I, which I can get into, but Joey ran away. He was hit by a train at night uh, and he had a broken hip and leg. His parents sued uh, the school for malpractice and when, uh, and negligence. When the government went in and investigated, they closed the school within six months. What? because of what they have found out. In other words, they, well, the right hand probably didn't know what the left was doing. They began looking into this place and saying, holy shit, there's mass graves, there's corpses, there's experimental programs. You know, they shut the whole school down for good, locked away the records. Um, people at the local museum began to uncover skeletons in the ground in the 1980s. Those were shipped away to the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, where they're still under lock and key. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, they did all this, just like they shut down the dig that we started in 2011. Um, they went after the, the sponsoring Mohawk elders in a big time. They threatened them, they paid them off. They did all sorts of stuff to shut down the, the dig because it was beginning to surface these bones again. Right, right. Well, we'll get to, we'll get to that in a second. Now, yeah. 
Um, now, what years, in this investigation, you refer to forensics and the things that you did uncover. Do you have an idea of how far back the findings went? You know, like, I mean, with, with the types of buttons and fragments and, and pieces of bone and, and that kind of thing that you found, do you know actually how far back those buried children went? Well, we know from what we found, we did two test digs, and uh, from the, what we found very near the school, um, the, the material that, that after the forensic people looked at it, they estimated it was from the 1920s and 30s, uh, what we had found. Um, but of course, it goes much earlier than that because written accounts describe in the 1880s, um, there being um, stories from children who had escaped of children hanging from the walls by their, by their hands, being chained to the wall, being tortured, of there being uh, child trafficking networks operating out of the school, that the principals were getting money from local white people to sell off these Indian kids and that, the kind of thing that went on consistently in many of this, these places. Um, so anyway, no, it spans that whole period, but of course the records have been, you know, the gov government of Canada admitted two years ago that they had been destroying records in these residential schools for many years. And so we're just getting bits and pieces, but where there's smoke, there's fire always, right? Sure. And I remember a very famous interview that I watched by a nun, goes back to maybe the 80s, and she came clean, said she had, uh, I think she started out at 17, her parents dropped her off at the convent, you know, it was the right thing to do in her generation, she wanted to give her life to God, and she goes into a detailed account of what her days were like. From the moment that she was there, they uh, immediately challenged her to have sex with the priest. Right. And because she refused to do so, and she was a virgin, they locked her downstairs in a completely dark area and they chained her to a wall. So this, I guess this is like standard operating procedure. If they can't break you, they, that's like one of the first things they do. Well, it still is the case. That is still going on constantly because the Catholic Church is a power into itself. It has its own self-governing policy called crimen solicitanus, where when t those kind of events happen and when children are harmed and raped, every priest in the world and every bishop is under papal order from Rome to not tell the police and to cover it up. And if they do talk about it, they're excommunicated. So it's a green light. It says in this institution, you can legally rape and torture whoever you want. And you're outside the law and uh you know even when i was thrown out of this protestant church i wrote to the attorney general in, in british columbia who's the head kind of law officer legal officer and i said you know i'm being railroaded out of this church without any due process he writes back a letter where he says the internal disciplinary processes of churches are outside this department in other words they're outside the law of the land churches can do whatever they want to their own inside their church. They have their own law of the land. They are their own law. And so naturally you're gonna have generation after generation of rapes, torture, killings, and nobody ever going to jail about it. And the Pope flying around the world and pretend to be a nice guy when he's sitting on the most criminal body in human history in terms of just the body count alone, right? Unbelievable. Well, tell us a little bit about the staff of this school. I mean, I was floored. Uh, by a couple of the fathers and the stories that were relayed from the testimonies as to what was done to them. How many people were on staff? Was everybody fully aware and, and involved in the goings on of the torture and the pedophilia and that sort of thing? They all knew. Um, that's the, the reality. You, you don't, you're not in a place like that a bit more than a day before you see things and you're told to shut up about it. Um, there's that famous uh, interview I did with a woman called Mary McFarlane, who was a white woman who worked at the Alberni Residential School where, near where I used to work. And um, she said she caught a matron beating a little Indian girl to death with a piano leg one morning, beating her on the head, the blood was flying. So Marion grabbed the woman and belted her, right? Knocked her cold to save that little girl. Guess who got fired? It was Marion who got fired for hitting that woman. Of course. And John, John Andrews, the principal said, Anything that happened to that little squaw would have been preferable to losing that woman because she plays the organ in church on Sunday. Oh my God! So, you know, as that shows you the the mentality, and it's the it's the same in any institution. 
uh, where there are these crimes going on, people, the humanitarian people are weeded out very quickly. And the ones who stay are the ones capable of looking the other way and doing these crimes. That's why it carries on and why it stays covered up because everyone's protecting everybody else, right? You know, and Kevin, it is really obvious to me that as, as we start going into this testimony, uh, those players that were involved in the, in the repeated torture and repeated abuse, and I mean, I'm talking folks like literally hitting them so hard so many times that they gave them brain damage or they died right then and there, like right on the spot. And we're not just talking fathers and, and priests, we're talking nuns. You know, yep. that was the part where I said, these are not human beings. They, they right. just don't think that way. They don't operate that way. I mean, it, it just. Well, they are actually. I mean, th th that's the funny thing. You know, you've, I think you've seen these. different species, Kevin. There are different species. They're like, um, you, you'd find about 80% of people in society could do that. They found these, these psychological tests where if it's not the person themselves who would do it, but when they're in a certain environment, in a certain chain of command, they will do these things. That's what they found. The psychopaths are a minority. Uh, that's not the problem. You know, it's like, like, um, like Vicki Stewart here. She was a little girl, uh, hit on the back of the head when she was nine years old because she wouldn't come into school quickly enough at the United Church School in Edmonton. The woman who killed her, Ann Kineski, uh, she died the next day of a brain hemorrhage, official cause of death, tuberculosis. Two eyewitnesses saw the killing. The police never did anything about it. They knew the name. They knew everything. They just refused. So when you have that collusion of church and state who are still in power, naturally you're going to get that. And the attitude among the general populace is, well, you can't go up against them. We'll just have to kind of turn a blind eye, I guess, because what can we do about it, right? It's kind of that feeling as well. So here's my question. You know, if, if yeah. it's closed in the 1970s, 1970 exactly, how much better is it now with the collusion of the state? Because I noticed that back then they didn't have a prayer. I mean, if they reported anything, it immediately went back into the loop of the corrupt people that were doing the actual crimes. You know, they, they, they never seemed to find any kind of justice, no matter where they went or what they did. I mean, they were that deeply entrenched in all of the institutions I noticed. So are you... Well, it's still that way now. It's still that way. I mean, there's no, there's no. No, you, you, you it, it's, movement. it's like when the, it's like in a small town when the local child rapist is exposed, he just changes location. Uh, it's not like the system changes. When the residential schools closed in the 19, late 1990s, the government simply transferred what was going on into private homes. They privatized it. So there's actually more native children in white foster homes now than there were in residential schools. They're still losing their language. They're still getting alienated from their family, which is what genocide does. Sure. And still being abused at an enormous rate. In Canada and America, you are something like 600 times more likely to be sexually assaulted in a foster home or in a government care system than it is in your own family. Six so, times. I mean, 600 times more likely times. by going through a government care system and what does that do? it means it's not there to take care of kids but to traffic them and to, and, to, and to exploit them and use them um that's happening as we speak that's so it, it's the government and churches had to frame this as, as oh this happened long ago and now we're making up we're giving them money and apologies right um the money compensation comes along with a gag order you can't get the money unless you agree never to sue these institutions and never to talk about it again so who does that serve right well, talk, talk to us a little bit about how did the original Mohawk tribe uh, get basically bought off? You know, what happened at, from that beginning? Well, you know, it's kind of like they were, uh, they sided with the British during the American Revolution. And so um, Washington and General Clinton burned out about 200 miles of corn in New York State because the Mohawks came from around Albany originally, eastern New York. That was their ancestral land. They were driven out. They burned up. The, the Mohawk name for George Washington is crop burner. That's what they call them. Mm. Uh, because they they destroyed the, the economic base of the Mohawk, all the cornfields. And so the Mohawks were driven up into, into Ontario, into Canada, where they were given a tract of land by this governor, Haldimand. And he 
said gee, Mohawks had land for as long as, as they want. Uh, within about 50 years, they had lost 90% of that to white settlers. And they're now on a little postal stamp sized reservations, um, which is about less than 1% of the original land base. So, you know, it's a gradual extermination. Uh, the reason that ha happened is because right at the very beginning, unlike the other tribes, the Mohawks say, said, we are sovereign nations. We are military allies with you guys. We're treating here as equals. You're not, we're not subordinate to your Indian Act, to your church, to anything. So early on, there were letters written saying, these Mohawks are a problem. We got to get rid of them. So in 1870, according to an eyewitness, this is a researcher for the Anglican Church called Leona Moses. I sat down with her and she told me all this stuff. We've got it all on, on record. Leona Moses said she found a document signed and stamped in 1870, stamped by the Crown of England, the New England Company, which was the school, the company that ran the mush hole, the Brantford School, and some of the non-Mohawk Indian tribes. And they said the Mohawks are going to be they didn't use the word, I think they used the word extirpated, which was the word back then for exterminated. And they're going to use the school to do that. They're going to force the Mohawks into oblivion and they're going to use the school to do that. So that's a smoking gun document that was, shows intent to wipe out the Mohawks using the Mushroom School. That, that was included in this, right? I, I remember seeing one document that had quite a bit of interest, interesting uh, tidbits, especially when alluding to their ultimate agenda, which was to take the land because right. of the resources that the land held. Absolutely. And now that area of Ontario now is very rich, prime real estate area. It's got a very heavily populated area because they did this to the Mohawks. Um, and those are the documents that the Anglican Church are now sitting on. There's these two Anglican Church officials. His name is Fred Hills. He's the top Anglican, uh, they call him the primate, uh, which is kind of a funny term. Uh, primate of uh, the Anglican Church in uh, in Canada, Fred Hills and Bishop Bob Bennett in London, Ontario. Those two were named in the common law court indictment in Brussels as having concealed and destroyed evidence, obstructed justice basically. They came in and destroyed documents, hid documents and ordered their staff and eyewitnesses to be quiet about it or they'd be sued by the church. Um, those documents are now sitting in Huron College in London, Ontario and uh, there's a group, a group of people there working with us, uh, sworn members of the Republic of Canada, who are going to go in and take those documents as public property, as evidence of a crime scene that the church is now sitting on. So that's some stuff happening over the next few weeks that is very exciting, which you know we can get into. Interesting. Yeah. Well, now you let's go back a little bit. You mentioned that the children, uh, you know, by law it was decreed that if the if the uh, Aboriginal children were seven and over, they were required to go into these schools. So how did they actually uh, get them to the schools? And I can't even imagine that the parents were super duper willing, you know, oh, hey, yeah, go ahead and take my kid to school. And, you know, how did well, that go down? Unfortunately, uh, you know, it was the old divide and conquer thing. We've got letters showing how local chiefs were paid by the government of churches to bring in the children from the reservation in return for money. And a lot of the chiefs did this, or they were given the promise that their kids didn't have to go to the school as long as you brought in the other kids. So often the chiefs would do it. Um, the Indians had no rights under the law. They could take their children at any point because they're wards of the state. They still are under Canadian law. That means they're, they're dependent legally on the government. They're not, they're like a child or a mentally incompetent person. They don't have the right to be a legal person under Canadian law. So you can take your kids and still under the Indian Act, you can't refuse medical treatment. If they, if they want to come in and use Indian kids off a reservation to test drugs, they'll be arrested if they refuse. So this That's whole, the Indian Act of Canada. So this whole stuff about, you know, the Indians living on uh, sovereign soil is a bunch of garbage. No, they've lost, um, you know, you know there's a few, who, few pieces of, yeah. of land that they actually have, Kevin. The reservations are what's called crown land. They're, they're holding, the British Empire did this all over the world, as did the Vatican. They come in, they conquer an area, and then they reissue the people's land back to them under puppet leaders. Uh, that's exactly what reservations are in Canada or America. They're, um, they're sitting on their own land, but they're alienated from their land. They're, they're occupying uh, the land, but they, it's not theirs. 
and um, they're managing the land for the crown. That's how it's legally they, they do it. So the children were not only brought in in that way by their leaders, but they were also the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and missionaries would go in there literally at gunpoint and grab the kids, take them away in buses, on trains, out on the coast, in boats, you know, where children are often often die and thrown overboard. I mean, this was stories I've been hearing for years from people. I just um, I just read yeah. part about how they they take they took fifty kids from one local tribe, I guess, and they put them in a cattle truck that was enclosed mm -hmm. and brought them to the school that way. That was in Edmonton. Yeah, that was the case. Um, and, the, and the person who described doing that, he said a number of the kids suffocated to death in that and in the cattle in, you know, in this, in this truck. Cause it was really they hot, just, right? It was really hot or something. Too. Oh yeah. The death, like I said, the death rate in the residential schools in Canada was double what it was in Auschwitz. The annual death rate in Auschwitz was about 25% because it was primarily a slave labor institution. Uh, the extermination rate in, in the average Indian school was much higher than in the European death camps. And it's one of the reasons why I decided to do this show with you today is that to me, it's such a wake up call that this kind of stuff that we usually attribute to war time activities or, oh, it's out outside of our countries. Oh, that happened over in Germany. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or that happened in the Philippines. But no, that's happening, and apparently still is happening, right in our back yeah. door. Well, exactly, because what Hitler did was he pioneered the permanent arms economy and the permanent uh, militarized state. And where all of society, its culture, its, its uh, entertainment, its economy is all geared to permanent war. And America picked that up in a big way after the war. And that corporate state has now become universalized. It's, it, we, we live under corporatocracies, which were pioneered by Mussolini and Hitler. So, you know, the, the elites don't operate according to national allegiances. They just have these different systems they're trying out. Um, and they use people like Indians and the homeless and prisoners and, and children all the time to test out these techniques for mass mind control, which is how they keep people in line. And again, at the Mohawk School in Brantford, they were pioneering these techniques early on. So, you know what's always something that's burning in my mind all the time that I keep forgetting to ask you until now? And that is, take, take a country like France, okay? Who would they target in France if they were doing this oh. sort of stuff? Oh, well, historically, it was my ancestors. Uh, that's why we left France. You know the name Annette? Annette? Um, anyone with kind of a French sounding name was probably Huguenot. And the Huguenots were the French Protestants, the dissidents, there was over a million of us. And they exterminated us. They, they literally went into whole areas and just wiped them out. And that's why we all had to escape to England and Holland. Um, you know, that's how my ancestors, they came to England in the 1500s from France to get away. Um, so it was religious uh, minorities. It was uh, anybody. The poor historically have always been used in this way. Uh, their children. So anyone that's speaking out against the actual regime. Anyone really. Uh, now that's been law. It, it all goes back to Rome. It all goes back to the, um, you know, the the uh, the laws and the attitudes of the, of the Roman Empire and the Church of Rome, which says anyone who isn't in our club is not a human being and is a expendable and that's been papal doctrine from the beginning so, sickening. so uh, now tell me a little bit let's get back to the actual staff members I mean because you have quite a bit of information on them who were the primary priests that ran this school now do you mean in the the mush hole in Brampton yeah, the mush hole getting back to the, the monster that we were talking about yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, they were they were Anglican priests, or in America you'd call them Episcopalian. They were like Church of England, um, and but there were also Catholic priests there. We found uh, the Vatican had a direct role in a lot of these experiments. Um, as a matter of fact, we've had psychics and also people who found documents which showed that the techniques they were using in the in the mush hole, the torture techniques, and that designed to break the, the, the human will and to modify how people thought and reacted in that, 
That was all being dutifully recorded and is stored in the Vatican archives in Rome. Um, and this is part of the centuries old, you know, kind of system of how to break a culture, incorporate them into the Roman system. But also um, there's a whole occult aspect to this too. And, uh, you know, the one of the, uh, the native women I work with, her uncle was actually a cardinal, a senior Catholic cardinal in, in Quebec. Wow. And she, he, ad he adopted her. Uh, often, you know, you find this adoption of native kids was kind of a fad for a while. He took her over to Rome in the late 1960s and took her down into the sub-basement area under the Vatican archives. Wow. And she said it was a state-of-the-art military-guarded installation. Yeah. Um, and in it, there were not only records, these old yellow parchments going back centuries. And he said, this is a record of all the inquisitors positions that have ever operated anyone who was ever tortured and killed record right in there and she saw on the wall these skulls and in 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 um glass jars um human remains and bones and things of um people over the centuries and i mean it's kind of like the you know the way an empire goes in and, and or a serial killer will save relics and and samples of their victims it's exactly that only on a big scale and so Again, all of these references are happening in, you know, in, in this mush hole. And so these were both Anglican and Catholic priests operating with complete immunity. I just sometimes, I mean, it's like I'm speechless. You know, people are going, really, yeah. you? No, <laughs> but so, uh, I, I, I think the other question I have is the Vatican focuses so much on the records of those that have been tortured and in fact there's been a lot of controversy this is just a little offshoot here there's been a lot of controversy as to how many people were truly tortured during world war ii in germany and the nazi concentration camps and i was curious is this basically just an offshoot of that that they just continued on I mean, what, yes. what is their obsession? You know, to me, I already have some ideas, but what it, do you feel is their obsession about torture of the human populace? Well, it's very old. I mean, it, it's, you know, the belief, if people listen to, by the way, my, my show every Sunday, 3 p.m. Pacific is Radio Free Kanata and uh, on the BBS radio system. And my co-host is a guy, Ryan Gable, who has... He's written a number of books about this, kind of this, the origin of a lot of these things. And it comes back to blood rituals, sacrificial rituals, in which the belief is that um, menstrual blood and the blood of the innocent of newborn babies has a, a power of life in it. And the capturing of that blood and the use in rituals uh, is key to maintaining your life. So, I mean, there are many stories over the centuries of European royalty bathing in the blood of little children and that actually documented, not just wild tales, but documented. Mm. These rituals continue. It's just that they were driven underground and they, they tend to happen on Roman ritual dates. For example, there was a, an accounting of um, uh, just uh, in 2013, an incident that happened in Rome in the Jesuit church there, not far from, from the Vatican, where eyewitnesses saw a young six-year-old boy killed. And it happened on March 24th 23rd and 24th, which is an occult sacrifice day. Uh, it's when uh, people tend to die on those days uh, because it's it was called the Roman uh, ritual of um, Terminalia and Ferelia, where they would take children, slave children, and, and animals and sacrifice them for the crops and for the ancestors, right? It was a regular. So these rituals have been going on literally for millennia. And it's tied up with a sense of uh, how do these elites maintain their their um, their longevity and um, their health. I mean, it's 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 that simple, really. You know, I don't, I'm not sure if you're aware, but David Wilcock just released a very uh, kind of groundbreaking video recently about who is really behind the Vatican. And one of his comments was that he believes that it is, it is probably associated with a extraterrestrial species called the progenitors. And the progenitors are cannibalistic. So, you know, 
I just want everyone to think, I mean, how many people do you know that want to eat someone's flesh and blood? How many people do you know that actually... Well, your average Catholic. <laughs> well... <laughs> But that's what you're told. It's the literal blood and body of Christ on Sunday. That's, and, you know, I was brought up Catholic, and I always kind of creeped out about that. And I would say, you know, we all we all just assumed that it was metaphoric. No. Know? We just assumed that that's what it was. Well, t I was raised that way as a Protestant, that it's just a symbol, a reenactment, symbolic reenactment. But the reality is, is that um, the, the, the Catholic Mass is actually... A satanic mass. It's it's based on the consumption of the flesh and blood of the innocent, and there's a message there. It isn't just to give life to these elites. There's a it's a, all about mass population control because they're telling everyone we have the right to kill you at any time. We can take your children at any point and just look at God. God gave His Son to be killed for all of you. Okay, and. He, he was the most perfect human being. That's why we sacrificed him. <laughs> Look at the message right there. It did. It did. You know, it's so twisted. It's really. It's how you traumatize. It's how you traumatize and control a population. That's you know? a good point. And, and I remember many of the churches that we went to regularly every Sunday, uh, you know, they read typically from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. um, you know, where the fathers sacrificed their sons for the glory of God and that kind of thing. Nothing ever resonated well with me, but anyway. So, uh, okay, so let's move on to the evidence that you found, because I think it's pretty amazing. Now, at what point did you get pulled into this whole mush hole, you know, investigation? Well, I'd been lecturing there as far back as 2008. I'd, I'd been invited by some of the Mohawk elders who had read about what I was doing out west. And um, they were people who had already, they were the fighters in their community. They were they, they had been doing road blockades to, to hold on to the last remaining Mohawk land. They were already very active. Mm. And they weren't tied into the government money, which is what you find on your any reservation. You've got the pro-government Indians, the traditionalists, the different factions, right? So it was the ones who were independent from the government who invited me. They sent me a letter in March 2011, and it invited me formally to come onto their land and to look for the remains of their children, both me and the tribunal, the ITCCS. And um, it, it, you know, it happened in two phases. There was an, uh, an exploratory phase where we got a, a machine called a ground penetrating radar machine, where it, it, it detects subsurface anomalies. You know, if there's been a lot of disturbances under the ground, it'll detect that. And the second phase was the actual dig. And, um, you know, there was, uh, that whole period lasted less than a year before it was shut down. Yeah, no, the, the first dig that you went, how far down did you actually dig? I think it said a foot, right? Well, yeah, there was two different test sites. We, the furthest we went down was a foot and a half. And uh, we found a lot, when you got down to the lower six inches, about a foot down, we found lots of bone fragments, lots of buttons, pieces of clothing, all of them identified as coming from school uniforms. And was there a reason why you didn't go any deeper? I was stopped. Uh, uh, we, the, the government Indians moved in and shut down the site and started threatening people. And, and uh, we only had a small window as we knew. We, you know, to, in yeah, the, you get as much done as, as possible, huh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but like, again, these bones turned out, several, several of them turned out to be human. All of the bones had been chopped up into little bits uh, and the bones were mingled in with the, the button remains and, and everything. Clearly it had been, um, I did my undergraduate in archaeology actually and so it kind of helped when I was doing this um, and they called in, often in digs you get what's called reverse stratigraphy. The stratigraphy is a normal, you know, uh, collection of remains so that the, the oldest tends to be the lowest and the newest on top but when there's been a lot of digging often that can be reversed so we found the oldest stuff was often at the top because there had been a lot of digging going on. And, um, you know, so the remains were very mixed up. They'd been chopped up and in many cases burned. Some of these bones had been burned. And that confirmed what people had told us is that often the children's uh, bodies were thrown in the school furnace after they'd been killed. That was a standard practice in the residential schools all over Canada. With, now, how did you determine where exactly you were going to dig? You know, I mean, what at what point did you say, okay, because it was a fairly large school area, right? So I was wondering, yep. 
you know, what evidence did you have as far as, okay, I think that's the place I'm going to go and start. Well, there were two eyewitnesses, Lorna McNaughton and uh, Geronimo Henry, and they had both buried children when they were there. And they, they literally said, go dig over there. That's where we buried them. And within half an hour, we found these bones and buttons, literally. So they were bang on. We also had a psychic who was seeing areas where the children had been buried. We were going to go to these other areas, but it got shut down before we could get there. Um, and also, the don't forget, we had done that survey, the ground penetrating radar survey, which had showed, showed us that there was definite a lot of soil dislocation. Um, there'd been a lot of burials going on. And tell them about that device and what happened with uh, the gentleman that actually came and used that and provided you some really cool feedback and then was suddenly pulled off of yeah. the investigation. Well, the machine was actually bought by the local tribal council. Now, that's the government Indians, okay? They're the ones who get the orders from Ottawa and the money and everything. And they had been under pressure from their own people, you know, to use this. So they had it. And the guy's name was Clint King. He was a technician. And he came out the first day of the site. And the uh, the guy who ran the tribal council, his name was uh, um, Montour, uh, George Montour. And he, he was approached by the local reporters. And he said, oh, of course, we're in favor of finding these children. You know, he had to do the political thing, which sure. was, seemed to be on site. So that gave us a few days leeway. And, and he sent Clint King out with the machine. And he, I remember I was standing there. I was operating him with the machine with him. He was showing me how to do it. And it, it um, you run it, it looks like a lawnmower and you kind of run it along the ground and you can look at the radar and what it's, you know, the soil that's manifesting. And as we were walking along, he said, oh yeah, well, there's 10 or 20 feet that's being dislocated. That's a lot of digging going on here. And um, Geronimo said, yeah, that's where we buried them right over there. And so it was jiving, the eyewitnesses accounts were jiving with the technical readouts we were getting. Um, Two days later, Mr. Montour gets called off to Ottawa to consultation with the government. The next day, Clint King gets a phone call saying, stop that right now. You cannot use that machine anymore and do not show the data to them. It was all pulled. We couldn't see the data. Um, we couldn't see anything. It was all shut down. And, um, you know, that's when the rumor mill started and the smear campaign and, the, you know, the typical things you get in this work. Um, you know, they began to s circulate stories. Yeah, Kevin Annett, this white man's coming in with a shovel and he's starting to uncover the remains of our kids. All of it a lie. Um, the dig was actually commenced by two Mohawk elders, Bill and Cheryl Squire, who, and we have this, you know, pictures of them and, and you know, starting the dig. It was, we were accompanied all along by the Mohawk elders and everything we did with their permission. So, you know, these smears you'll still see on the internet was, was generated by the government right at the same time as they tried shutting down the dig. So that smear campaign is still running strong because that's one of the things that's out there right now is oh you know you you basically yeah, yeah. did this without the approval of no, but that's all you know when you look at the history and all of our videos you'll see that that isn't the case right. uh they, they bought one of the guys one of the elders who had um and this is the the videos you'll see online uh attacking us his name was uh frank miller he was one of the original elders and he was approached he was basically given money um to, to come out against us. And he's the one on the video saying, we Mohawk elders don't support Kevin Annett. He's done a lot of damage here. He was one out of 10. And two of the elders, Cheryl and Bill Squire are still with us. Uh, the other six or seven uh, or, were frightened off. And one of them actively working for the government now. So, you know, they've got the money to get this stuff around to get everybody to believe in their interpretation of what happened. But I mean, the, the truth, we, we're standing on these, this evidence we brought up and, and the course, you know, we've documented the whole, everything that happened there. You know, Kevin, I think the, the other really good thing that you're showing is that a lot of us tend to see the, even like for me, the American Indians, we tend to see them as this unified force that's been, you know, sub. No that's been oppressed and and really screwed you know and uh what you're showing me is that there's actually factions within the oppressed as to how they cope with it and they deal with it and some are actually making you know backdoor deals to keep their own children from you know being in danger and that kind of thing did do they typically nope. focus on those that have the clout yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it happened all over the world. It, it happened to our ancestors in Europe. That's why, uh, you know, the Scottish Highland 
the clan chiefs ship their own people in slave boats over to Jamaica at the behest of the British. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's it's the old pattern, the the imperial pattern. You do that. But I mean, um, but I mean, are they are they? A, yeah. I'm sorry, but are they focusing on the actual uh, chiefs and the elders more so than anybody else? You know, because well, they were, yeah. Yeah, they were cultivated that way in the residential school. They would pick out the kids who would collaborate and they would give them better treatment. This was the common practice. I hear this from survivors all the time. There was a protected group and then the general crowd. And if you were willing to rat out your fellow students, you could get better treatment, better education. You weren't raped as much. Uh, you could do that to other kids if you wanted. These kids usually went on to become the tribal council chief because they'd been controlled. And you know, if you talk to your average native politicians in Canada, the one on the on the on the uh, six figure salary income, they're all in favor of working with the government and they want reconciliation and they don't want these digs going on. And and we don't want to talk about children being killed. I mean, they're completely colonized in their thinking. And, you know, they're apples white on the inside, red on the outside. You know, it's it's they're the ones who, who run the show. They're the ones quoted on the media all the time. These other natives who haven't been you know, brainwashed that way. They have nothing. They're the ones living on the street. They're dying at a, at a, at a huge rate. The highest, the death rate in the native world is still as high as it was 50 years ago. They rank as a third world nation in terms of death rate. Those are the ones who've kept their soul, but they're easily targeted and destroyed. And that's the, those are the ones I work with. And that's why our investigation keeps going up and down all the time, because it's, we don't have that, that, that kind of support that you would do if you're working for with the bought off chief, right? Right, right. So the corruption is just as deep within those that have been subjugated as it has with those that have not. Uh, you know? I remember uh, Lorna McNaughton, uh, one of the witnesses uh, from the Mushal said, there was only two kinds of people who survived, the slaves and the sellouts. Mm. Uh, you had to cooperate or you'd die. You know, you're five years old, you're being raped every day, you're, you're, you, you know what you had to do to survive. You had to be quiet and go along or actively collaborate. And the, the, the ones who kept themselves, they, they were killed off. It's, it, and so you don't find many people left who are, who are able to not, not collaborate. Right? It, it, it's, um, not any of them. I mean, people say indigenous people, I say, well, show me some, you know. Show me some real indigenous people. Yeah. We're really getting interference right now. So um, your last yeah. sentence, your last sentence was. Um, my last sentence. Geez, there you go. That was my memory again. <laughs> and you're, you're testing my limits here. I'm 60 almost, you know. Um, I said, find a real indigenous person. Right. Like people talk about indigenous people, but I say, show me one. Um, they're about as common as an indigenous Irish person, right? I mean. Wow. That says a lot. Know. Wow. Yeah. Now, the other thing is talk a little bit about, okay, just talk a little bit about the daily routine and the normal life of these children in this school. Well, they they were. They're, like mind blowing for me. Complete regimentation, um, hair shaved, uh, standard uniform, boys and girls separated so they could never mix. So people told me they didn't see their little brother again for years, even though they're in the same building. Total segregation of the sexes. That's defined as a prime genocidal te technique yeah, under international law. You segregate the sexes, you don't know how to relate to the others. How, what are, you, how are you gonna treat your kids when you're older, right? I mean, it's designed for self-destruction, just segregating them that way. Um, total brutality, violence and, and rape could descend at any moment. Uh, starvation, torture, um, minimal education, and using them as a slave labor population, basically. The, like I say, go to itccs.org and hiddenolonger.com. It's all documented, all of the tortures. Uh, 58 things were documented by us, defined as torture or genocide under international law that went on routinely in these schools, decade after decade, with the government and the church knowing fully about it. Now, Kevin, I was just flabbergasted by the testimonials from some of these people that they admitted 
that when they went in to go see the doctor because they didn't feel well, these were the ones that actually said they didn't feel well, um, they walked in only to find a doctor that was speaking with a very thick German accent and they didn't get treated for maybe a sore throat or a flu or whatever, but they actually ended up getting an injection in both of the nipples within their chest. Can you talk to them a little bit about that? I mean, I was just- That was at Cooper Island Catholic School, yeah. Um, <sighs> that came out in our first tribunal in Vancouver in 1998. A whole group of people came over from Cooper Island. It's in the Gulf Islands near Vancouver Island. And uh, the, the Catholics, uh, and the Jesuits ran a school called Cooper Island. And um, these these men and a few women described how they were used in uh, 1939, before World War II, there were these German speaking doctors that came over, they needed translators uh, and they were giving them injections near their nipples. And the kids were all getting sick and dying from these things. And they get very strange boils breaking out. They, they were testing some kind of drug on them. Um, some of the kids, their bodies would blow it up. They would, it just very weird symptoms. Um, and very and sick, right? Very nauseous, vomiting. Sick, and they died after a few days. There was these yeah. yellow pus coming out of their eyes and ears. I mean, it was just very strange. They were, they were testing out uh, experimental birth control devices, IUDs on young native girls, and then they'd die from it after having it implanted in them. Um, yank out their teeth without painkiller. That was a constant practice. I saw that. I've even got documents show, listing the children who had anesthesia and who didn't have anesthesia during tooth extractions and fillings. Um, they targeted, the, the collaborators would get the painkiller, the kids who didn't play ball would have it just yanked. Um, so I mean, you know, that was again, standard practice. Unbelievable. And how about, uh, you know, I know that they would have those that were actually healthy sleep with those that were sick with tuberculosis. So eventually, didn't it actually take over the whole school? Yeah, well, that was, we've got letters describing 90% of the kids have TB. I mean, here's the thing, here's the key piece of evidence when we're talking about the plan that this was deliberate, because you don't die very easily from tuberculosis. It's a wasting away disease. You have to have been exposed to it for many months under substandard conditions of health to allow your immune system to break down so much it, that it carries you away. So that's why they would take children, white children who had it and put them in sanitarium right away. But with the native kids, they were allowed to continue to mix together in unheated dorms with, with constant stress and torture and hardly any food. That's set up so that tuberculosis will kill them off en masse. And that's proof of intentionality right there. That, you know, what else was, uh, there was a testimony in here where she said that she would actually get up, she was smart enough, even though she was very young, to go and open the window, you know? And the, would, then the nuns would nail the window shut, yeah. The window shut. I was like, well, how deliberate is this? Well, that's right. Now, that's in, in, in the academic world in Canada and the media and that they will never address that issue. I keep saying, explain the massive death rate over 50 years. They won't touch that issue and they won't touch this question either because they know it proves that it was intentional and they have to continue to spin it like, oh, it was kind of sad, some kids died, but we did our best and, and now we're sorry for it. I mean, you know, it's just nonsense. Right? It is. And I, I was also surprised to see how many of the children had actually seen other burials happening. They were very yeah, was, aware that those burials were continually going on. So I, that was probably another subliminal way to, without saying, hey, you're next if you don't stay in line. You know? Yeah, well, I've had people tell me that as a little kid, they were held over an open grave by a man saying, you're going to go in next. We're going to bury you alive if you don't behave. Um, and actually helping, there was a f infamous case of um, uh, the man up in... Uh, um, Edmonton, who they put a kid in the coffin while he was still moving. <gasps> he was still alive. And the priest said, go ahead and bury him anyway. They did it because they didn't want to get hurt themselves. And he was really worried about that. He couldn't let his mind couldn't get off this kid. So he went out early in the morning to the grave and the, the ground had been disturbed. And this kid's hand was part out of the ground. He had tried to crawl his way out of the coffin. And he realized... <laughs> He was alive when we buried him, and I mean, 
And that wasn't uncommon. I mean, this is all at itccs.org, all the testimonies, all the documents. I mean, it's all there if people take, take the time, you know, to look at it. Unbelievable. And some of the other very common uh, torture was gang raping by the fathers and the nuns, right? I mean, wasn't there that kind it, of stuff it, going on? It was prescribed. It was a routine practice to rape the children when they arrived because you break them down that way. Well, you'd only, you don't only break them down and, and allow conformity, but you, uh, at a young age, when that happens to you, as you know, you create multiple personality within a child. Yes. It's standard. Uh, you know, that's one personality has to segregate so they, they can't remember the horrible things done to them. Correct. Especially if it's done between about age before three, then they're, they're, they're gone for life. I mean, they're just severe MPD. You need, for these medical experimentation programs, you need people, multiple personality, because don't forget the MK Ultra program with the CIA was to create these multiple personalities who can then be trained as uh, sleeper assassins, uh, messengers who could be triggered, given government information, and then triggered with a certain word, code word, to release that information. Uh, one personality would know that the other was a killer or a messenger. CIA developed this in a big way using Nazi research from World War II. And um, they needed this population that had been pre-programmed that way. You needed systematic MPD ch kids for these programs. So that's why they were, so many of them were raped and tortured on mass. To, they made a lot of money selling these kids off to big pharma, to uh, military installations, you know, during the 50s and 60s, especially. That's when one of the high points. Wow. Now, no. you, you did try to go back in for phase two to do some additional digging. And at that point, I thought it was fascinating what you ended up uh, contacting. I believe he was a coroner. Um, and then you got the door shut on that. So then you went. He to was not only. Right. Well, we not only we we not only had the provincial coroner. This is the top official in Ontario. For investigating grave sites and he's the one who said i'm 95 percent certain this is a young kid's knee socket uh greg olson he was then shut down he was told that by the government never to come near that site again he just disappeared after that i took those bone samples and i sent them to the smithsonian institute in washington Interesting. okay the, this is the top facility in america for testing forensic and it was sent to a guy called dr don ortner and don ortner was he died. Don Ortner was the top specialist in the world for detecting disease off bone samples. He would have been ideal for detecting tuberculosis in bones, like which is a common killing technique in residential schools. I send the bones to Don Ordner and I start communicating by email. The first one was kind of a gruff response. He said, well, it looks animal to me, but I'd have to test it, right? Second one, he comes back much more subdued and he says, I think it's human. And I said, well, that would agree with what Greg Olson told us. He said, do you have more of these? And I said, there is a lot more, but we need you to come up to give this thing legitimacy. You know, we need your help because it's shut down by the chiefs, by the Canadian government. He said, this was January, 2012. I last spoke to him, late January, 2012. He said, I would more, be more than happy. I've got a very busy schedule. He had to fly somewhere in the world to some forensic pathology conference, but he said, come spring, I will be happy to come up and help you. He dies in early April of a heart attack. He was 69 and in good health. And I tried to call the family to find out they would never return my calls. So go figure. Now, but here, you, uh, wait, there's, there's one final piece here, which is convincing. You know, the smear campaign, there's several of these regular government backed websites that just go after me all the time, right? Uh, one of them, the woman, was sneering about a couple of weeks. This was late March. She was actually saying that Don Ordner is never going to come to Canada. What? That's a couple of weeks before he dies. I think they they kind of jumped the gun. They do this sometimes. They they gloat and they say, "Hi, hey, you're never going to get that guy," because they knew he, they, he was marked for being removed. And um, that to me was an interesting P.S. to the whole thing. How they seemed to know that Don Ordner wasn't going to show up. Well, now with this amount of interference, I would have thought you would be very apprehensive to let go of some of the relics, some of the 
uh, findings, some of the bones and things that you found? Were you kind of apprehensive to let go of that because you may never see it again? And how did well, you feel that? Personally, I was, but I was caught in or between a rock and a hard place because I couldn't be the white guy holding on to native bones, right? Uh -huh. The protocol was we had to return these bones to the elders, which is what we did. Okay. which kind of belies the whole uh, smear about me that I'm somehow just hoarding this for myself. We gave them all back to the elders. Mm -hmm. And when they got influenced, who knows who has them now? Probably the government has them or they've been pulped or something. But um, so that, you, unfortunately... You, Kevin, you actually received them back from Dr. Ortner, even though he was knocked off? Uh, he uh, sent them back because it was their policy not to hold on to samples okay. without the, you know, he examined them and then he sent them back. I passed them back to the Mohawk elders. They went off the radar screen and probably the government has. Do these you know or somebody. the same ones that you submitted? Yeah. yeah well, the, the one submitted was the same knee socket that Greg Olson had identified. Okay. And we've got pictures, you know, it's the picture I showed you. Um, so you feel like it was the same thing you had given him. I was curious about that. Yeah. Well, so then how how long did the interference go on to the point where the whole thing was just finally shut down? It was shut down by the spring of 2012. And um, the, the, people, the people I was working with, they still support me. They're kind of working underground, providing me information, waiting for that moment when we can go back there. And the way to do this would be with some kind of international warrant. Uh, whereby the Canadian government and the tribal council couldn't interfere. This is, they do that like in places like Serbia and, you know, Rwanda and that, where they go in and they say, that's a mat, that's a crime scene. That's a mass grave site. You know, international law allows us to go in there and, and examine that. And that's probably going to be the only way it'll happen. And, and so what is happening with that land now? Is it, is it actually fenced off? Do they have guards and, are they no but the the most recent report is that it's been it's been uh covered over it was dug up again less than a year after so they went in there to look themselves oh. um it had been dug up more and now it's kind of lawned over um and i think they're planting more trees there and everything so definitely again a mission of guilt <laughs> on their part um That's crazy. and of course the the whole other the whole other aspect of this is uh, under the declaration that established the common law jurisdiction in Canada, the Republic of Canada, we would have the right to go, go in there because it's like the tribal council, they're all agencies of the crown, which have been lawfully disestablished as criminal bodies. So if push came to shove, I don't think the police would stop us because they recognize the crime. And, and uh, we've done, we found this before in church occupations and that they tend to stand back if you push. Uh, and say, look, these are criminal bodies. They don't have the right to tell us not what to do. Right? Well, so, hey, anybody who's listening to this, if you live up in the Canada location of Brantford, right? Brantford, Ontario, or the, that vicinity, mm -hmm. please help Kevin. Um, I, you know, that would be really awesome to gather a group of people together that are very aware of what's happening on the planet and to give him some support to make this happen. I think it would just be a huge breakthrough, huge breakthrough. Well, we, we definitely need that, but if people have to get over the mental hurdle that we're allowed to do it. Um, when there's been a crime in your community, you have an obligation to do it. When the police and courts are colluding and covering up the crime, common law says you have the right to go in there, and make citizen arrests, seize documents, all of that stuff. And so we do have a group in London, Ontario, uh, where these Anglican church records are being held, uh, proving all this stuff. And, and like I said earlier in the show, they plan to go in and seize the documents. On uh, May 24th, they're going to crash the, uh, there's a, a gathering in London, Ontario, of, of all the bishops, the Anglican bishops. They're going to go crash the proceedings and demand, you know, these documents. Create a real stink, so it should be fun. When is this? May 24th. May 24th? That would be That's a problem. Sunday. May 24th, 25th, yeah. We're Wait. gonna We're going to film all that and post it. That, that is totally cool. Now, before we dive into some of that, just let's tie up with a few things. The other thing I wanted you to clarify is how did the people that were working at the school covertly move these bodies around without everyone seeing what was going on? 
Well, don't forget, even if everyone saw it, so what What could these people do? They're all in on the conspiracy, and the kids are too brutalized to do anything about it. So it, it isn't really a problem really? getting rid of bodies. Standard techniques is they'd burn them in the furnace, they'd bury them on the school grounds, or they'd get third-party contractors to come in and take the bodies out. And those third parties, you can find, uh, well, any number of groups would do that, including organized crime. Um, you know, body disposal isn't that really that big a problem. Now, in these incinerators, that was just a normal thing to have at the school. That, is this the one that was sub-basement? Yeah, well, the, the, uh, there tended to be these sub-basement areas where they would do these rituals. And uh, definitely at the mush hole, they had it. Okay. But it was, yeah, next, I've been inside the school um, once when we went in there. Uh, it's got an ama a horrible, creepy feeling about it. Even if I didn't know about this stuff, it, it's hard to walk into some of these rooms, right? Um, but yeah, the furnace was going day and night, according to the people who were there, right? Oh my God. And, and also, weren't there underground tunnels? There was a tunnel that went from the furnace room to um, what used to be one of the uh, um, staff areas where the staff lived. So in other words, they could bring the kids out, they could come in at night and not be detected when they wanted a kid for whatever reason, right? Right, right. Oh my God. And so you've mentioned Leona Moses. You've let, you've mentioned a lot about her and how she was uncovering a lot of the deaths and that kind of thing. One of the things that I wanted to ask you was, she said that the the, the records were going to be sealed. Now, has anyone else been able to be successful in either gaining access to those records or unsealing any of those records in any part of Canada at this point? Well, no, we've tried on a couple of occasions. The records are held in Toronto and in London, Ontario, in the Anglican Church offices there. Um, and we've already issued uh, common law search and seizure warrants, which allow any citizen to go in and say, you know, you're sitting on material of a crime scene. The public has the right to know these things. Um, Leona, there's a report from our, my conversation with Leona up online at itccs.org. Right. And one of the things one of the things she describes is um, that um, the the bishop Bob Bennett was told that um, um, the records were not to be opened by anybody; only the lawyers could see them. It was a group of about 20 boxes, including this document about you know the smoking gun document about the plan in 1870 to wipe out the Mohawks using the school. That's one of the documents that were in there. Um, and they, they literally told every clergyman and every employee of the Anglican Church that they would face major lawsuits if they ever talked about these records. Wow. Yeah, that was as recently as last year. And and I know you you talked a little bit about the document, the, the really main damning document that transferred authority of uh, the school to the Confederacy. Do you remember that? If yes. kids targeted for uh, incarceration or extermination, any others targeted by having um, any knowledge about this. So, I mean, th this is in black and white. That's the part I was just like, it was just a normal document document that was being passed from one uh, division to another. I mean, it, I don't know. It's such a wake up call for me, folks. It 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 was. I'm, I'm speechless, you know. Anyway, uh, now, other than tuberculosis, rape... I know. What did you say? Oh, I'm sorry. I said, looks like we've got interference again. Big surprise. Every time we talk about the Native nations that collaborate with the government, we get this interference. Yeah. I think they're concerned about that piece coming out. But, no, the, the 1870 document, just to clarify, was a plan of all the other tribes, the Seneca, the, um, you know, the five nations, the Seneca, uh, or the different nations, they agreed to help wipe, wipe out the Mohawks in exchange for benefits, you know, money, more land, their own kids being not touched. So, you know, it's the old divide and conquer. Clarify again, because you, you, uh, you cut out the five core uh, in there was, besides the Mohawk Confederacy, oh. there was the Seneca, Seneca, the Onondaga, the Seneca, the Tuscarora, um, 
Iroquois, like Haudenosaunee, and somebody can remind me. I don't know. They, and they, they were, they, it's on online. You can okay. find that stuff. Okay. I'm just curious. Wow. Okay. So now at this point, do you feel England is still just, they're still funding the Anglican Mohawks? It's still happening? They are. Okay. We do. We know they are. There's a thing, you can look it up online. It's called the New England Company. They still have an office in London. They still fund work among the Mohawks, missionary work. Now we know what that means historically. Um, we, we know that they are, it's been one of the sources for child trafficking. Um, you see, once you've done this to a group of people and they start doing it to themselves, they're completely susceptible for, you can continue to grab the kids and nobody cares. I mean, that's why we say, you know, the, the, the reason we got to get into this evidence is because it's describing ongoing crimes, not yeah. just what happened yes. 50 years ago, right? Well, okay. And talk a little bit about the gauntlet. I thought that was very interesting, how they prevent the kids from unifying to support one another. Right. Well, if anyone, quote, misbehaved, they'd have to run the gauntlet. The kids would all be armed with a stick or something, an iron pipe or something. And you'd have to run down it and they'd smash you. And uh, you often died from it. I mean, and that way, the kids are learning, well, to survive, you got to kill one another. But it also makes them accomplice. You see, it's very smart. It means they're an accomplice and they don't want to talk about things when they're adults because they figure they're going to be exposed from what they did. Mm -hmm. So everyone's quiet because they, they all feel guilty and complicit, which they were, of course, but it ensures secrecy, right? The other thing, too, I had another aha is when I was reading the gauntlet uh, technique to keep, every, you know, to have the divide and conquer type of scenario going on is I remember several movies I've seen, I think, that were related to the Skull and Bones. Uh and some other secret societies, and they use that technique. And these were all oh, yeah. older, older, gentle, older, older guys that were being initiated. It's an old technique, and in fact, they use it on a broader scale. I mean, whistleblowers like me, that's exactly what they do to us. We have to run the gauntlet of public criticism of all our friends who've turned against us, of people who know if they put in a whack, they'll learn the favor of the system. And uh, it, it's kind of like we all have to do that. We all have to face that when we go up against the system. So it's a very tried and true method that goes back, you know, millennia. That's crazy. And and so now with this investigation behind you, uh, is there any word that you're going to return? Uh, you know, are you planning to get, get a group of people together? I mean, is this something that you're slating to do and get that done it's this in, year? It's happening. It's in the, it's in the works. It's... Uh, people who have volunteered for the Republic of Canada. And again, that's at canadarepublic.ca if people want to look up that work. Um, people have volunteered, have, have taken a lead in this and they've organized a whole uh, two different groups in the London and Toronto area to do the, these actions. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll be, be involved in that, but I don't want to say right now in what, when or in what capacity. Well, and, and now you also said, and I want the, I want, the audience to understand that the other reason this is so important is that the crown really felt the pinch of this investigation. And I kind of wanted you to go over that as to how oh, well, that's, they responded yeah. to this. The, uh, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Justin Welby, and his predecessor uh, both ordered the Anglican Church to destroy any evidence related to the royal family. Now, being present at these schools. Now that's quite an admission. They're saying that members of the royal family were over there doing kind of questionable things. Yeah. That came out right after, you know, the period in the spring um, of 2012 when Don Arthur died. It came out right then. The, the edict from London came to Toronto to this Fred Helps's office. We know that from an insider who worked in the office. They were told right then that none of this evidence was to be released pub publicly ever, especially if it involved the royal family. So that's direct obstruction of justice by the Crown. Interesting. And wasn't there also a testimony of the Queen and the Prince that there were 10 Aboriginal children involved with them? That's that's out west. That was, um, my friend William Coombs was killed over that because he was the eyewitness when Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip showed in, up at the Kamlo, uh, in Kamloops. Oh, they really Columbia, the, the Catholic schooler. 
They, are they showed up on October 10th, 1964. Add up the numbers, they're all equal 10. Children taken away. So, yeah. okay, go go back a second, because we really missed... Children taken away, they were never seen again. Okay. So, 1964, because you had total interference through that whole passage. William Coombs saw uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip show up at the, Cap the Catholic school in Kamloops, British Columbia, on October 10th, 1964. And 10 children, so 10, 10, 1964, they all ate equal 10. Got it. Ten, 10 children taken away. They were never seen again. And, uh, uh, you know, they, and then William died just before he was to come to London to give testimony about that. He died of lethal injection at a Catholic hospital in Vancouver. Um, we've, we've established that. Jesus. But, but the, the other thing about, to show how it's all cultic, there were seven boys and three girls, you know, the biblical book of Job. Seven boys and three girls were sacrificed by God, Job's children, uh, to test the faith of Job. He lost seven boys and three girls. I mean, it's it's right out of, it, all of this is, is not accidental, right? It's just incredible. So I highly recommend that you visit itccs.org for any more details. We're going to try to put some clips on this video so you have some of the pictures that Kevin has sent, submitted to me. But the testimonies of the survivors of the, these residential schools in Canada are unbelievable. And, and they're now, I think the, the main thing is, is that they're now in their uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s, I thought I read, uh, where I, I, I remember one of them, she says she can't even come out of her house. She's, she's just so traumatized. She can't even come out of her house. So. That's right. That's terrible. that. That's common. So but no, I will send you more clips. And uh, again, people should just go to itccs.org and educate yourself. And if you're in Canada, uh, help us. If you're in Eastern Canada, contact us um, uh, at, well, you can just write to me, hiddenfromhistory1 at gmail.com, and uh, we'll link you up with what we're doing. And it's hidden history, the number one, okay? Hidden from history, hidden from history number one at gmail.com. Right. So, okay, now that we've covered all that, can you give us any good juicy updates on uh, anything else that you've uncovered as of late? Because I know you've been... Well, you know, busy. well, related to that, I mean, uh, um, we, we found out, for example, today, one of the people in, in Toronto tried to go into the archives there, and he had the police waiting for him. The police at the door, not letting them into the archives. Now, what does that tell you right there? I mean, it means they're very nervous, right? Yeah. They're nervous about this stuff getting out. Yeah. Um, we've, we've had a lot of things. Like one of the things happening on in Vancouver on the West Coast is there's a common law being convened, common law court being convened into all the child trafficking going on. We've yeah. talked a little bit about the, about the Pacific Rim trafficking going on. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's constant, these efforts. And... Um, what we're trying to relate it to, of course, is when Pope Francis comes to America in September, because he's visiting uh, Congress and uh, the United Nations. He's the chief officer responsible for a lot of these crimes. And um, so there's going to be, again, efforts to uh, perform citizen arrest on him, at least publicize the fact that we want to do that. Hopefully, they'll get the Vatican a bit nervous. A little nervous. Yeah, heck yeah. And well, when they're nervous, they do dumb things. <laughs> and and what is you know what is your take on some of the things that are going on with the Vatican at this point? I noticed that they're talking a great deal more about extraterrestrials. Uh, it's almost as if they're trying to prepare us for something. And I'm just curious, you know, how do you feel that's dovetailing into your investigative work? Well. You know, I find with elite systems of power, they will never, what they say is never what is going on. I mean, <laughs> it's all about control, right? True. If there was something genuinely going on, they're not going to announce it to us. Um, it's kind of like you never see who's really in charge. You see their puppets. You see what they want us to see, right? And if they're suddenly talking about extraterrestrials and that, I think that it's primarily distraction. I think it's also to get ahead of an issue and to try to control it and co-opt it. Um, I mean, it's all of that because we know in practice that's how they operate. They're not going to suddenly change overnight when it comes to do with something like that. 
So I think it requires a lot more digging to find out exactly where is the source of this stuff, um, who's initiating it. We know there's different factions in the Vatican, just like in any group. Um, and so, you know, we'd have to have more information, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, and where is your future taking you at this point? What are your plans for this month? Oh, well, yeah. That you, no, can, it's, share it's, that you, you can share you with us. You notice that I look kind of tired. I'm taking some more inner time. You know, I, now is the time for real inner clarity, like we often talk about. Yeah. And uh, at, by the end of the summer, I'll be going back to Europe. I can tell people that uh, because there's some very hopeful things happening over there. Um, and just, you know, doing my thing, traveling around the continent, uh, working Good. where I'm needed. So Good. I'm, you know, working on a new book. I guess people know about the other novel I just wrote, with Samuel Wedge, yeah. which uh, you can get through Amazon. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And how about so, the common law groups? How, how are they doing throughout the world? Well, in Canada, they're, they're beginning to take off slowly. I mean, um, you know, people have to learn that they have that capacity within themselves to act right. for themselves and not look to some surrogate, you know, conscience or, or authority figure to, to say, yes, you can do this now. Um, so that's a slow process, but I'm finding more people are coming forward gradually. So, do you, do you find that a certain number of a group is more beneficial to keep the momentum going? I find that it's important not to be too big, um, big. because you know I I work with small action groups of three to ten people, three not even ten often. Okay. Uh, Three to five, I think, is the good optimum group because people can get to know each other really well. They can know what's possible and what isn't, and they're off the radar screen. So if they show up to do an action, they can go in and out quickly, make the impact, and not worry about too much repression or monitoring because we need all those little cells operating rather than a big organization, which, from my experience, it's happened three times to me. Build an organization is destroyed from within. Yes. Uh, yeah. Classic divide and conquer smear, you know. So we have to keep, like... Recognize that we're at war, where we operate according to an underground cell structure, but we're as visible and public as possible with our message at the same time. Uh, we can't give in to fear, you know. Good point, good point. Well, Kevin, as always, you know, we just commend you for, you know, you're taking on the shadow of all of society. Um, and I was talking to someone a couple days ago and I said, by far, this is without a doubt the deepest, darkest, nastiest uh, energies that all of us have been affected by. It is in yeah. every part of our lives and our worlds and in our past lives and our, it, you know, there isn't a person on the planet that is not affected by this action to bring this system to a halt, period. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just, I commend you. I, it's something that I don't think I could do. <laughs> I just, well, we never know until we're in it when we have to do something. And then yeah. we, we, we acquire a new strength that we didn't know was there. You know, I'm, I'm blessed by that. But, uh, uh, you know, I said we've got to reclaim our world, but we have to reclaim ourselves for that. So that's kind of what guides me. Yes, yes. Reclaim yourself and your world. Well, please, everyone, continue to support Kevin Annette's work at itccs.org. And you can also reach him, as he said, hidden from history, the number one, at its Gmail? Gmail. Gmail.com. And thank you so much for listening today. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to drop me a line. You can reach me anywhere, anyhow, on the website at galacticconnection.com. And we have a bunch of cool new things coming out. So check out all the widgets on the columns down the side. Uh, we have the new uh, past life clearing. Uh, it's, it's a session that's just mind blowing that's, that's come out. Uh, we have a new person coming on board that will be handling curses and spells and demonic spirits, by the way, Kevin, in case you run into that. And we've got just, uh, I mean, just so much stuff going on. And th this is a very exciting time. We are really getting to a place where uh, action is the key word here. So I call out all the guardians, especially, 
uh, to be ready because I'm about to put something out regarding that. If you have any questions on the implant removal process, feel free to visit the upper widget on the top left side of Galactic Connection. And with that said, as always, you guys are awesome. I tell everybody you're probably one of the most incredible audiences on the planet. And people like Kevin agree with me. I hear that a lot. So thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your support. Thank you for supporting Kevin and all the other people that I interview because we are making a difference and we're becoming more aware of what's going on. Awareness definitely lifts out the darkness. So, um, Anyway, lots of love. You guys have an awesome rest of the week. Yeah, I was going to say year. <laughs> and we'll uh, see you next week, same time, same place. Thanks again. And thanks, Kevin, for all Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. <laughs> you okay. too. Take care. Bye.